It is so good to see you tonight. Thank you for being here, all of you who are tuning in on the live stream. I'm Pastor Tito, your high school and young adults pastor, and it's truly an honor to be here. And for the young adults in the room and any high school seniors, I just want to take a second and invite you this Friday to our young adults gathering taking place over at the Student Center at 7. And afterwards, we'll be on embarking on a very crazy uh, video scavenger hunt for $10. You can sign up online at Westover Hills at church slash events. So enough with the announcements. Tonight, we're wrapping up our unshakable series. And our heart for you is that your life would begin to change. That when this world comes at you and begins to shake you at your core, one earth-shattering circumstance after another, that you would be able to stand firm in what is true and continue in your convictions even when you don't feel it. One of Jesus' most interesting promises comes to us in an account given by John, one of Jesus' closest friends in a journal that John kept about Jesus. You'll see this in John chapter 16, verse 33. And it's one of the most strangest promises that Jesus makes to all of his followers. Are you ready? Are you ready for this one? Here it comes. It says, in the world, you will have trouble. Awesome. Thanks for the encouragement, Jesus. That's great. I mean, you don't see that one floating around Instagram. You don't, you don't see that one floating around Facebook. You don't see believers going, getting that tattooed on their arm, right? But he wasn't kidding. And if you've been a follower of Jesus for more than 20 minutes, you know how true that is. And in a universe that we believe is ultimately being led by the hand of an all-knowing, all-powerful, and holy God, at times, if we're honest, it just feels like it's spun out of control. And, and it, in the midst of the chaos, it's easy to doubt, and it's easy to question, and say things like, why, why would God fill in the blank? Or how could God fill in the blank? Or why isn't God fill in the blank? And if we're honest, sometimes it's really difficult to keep a faith in a God that we can't see with our eyes or touch with our hands. And sometimes I think about what it must have been like to have been one of the followers of Jesus in the first century. Can you imagine being handpicked by Jesus and going wherever Jesus goes? And, and you're following wherever he goes. You're on the journey of a lifetime. Jesus walks on water and you're there. Jesus feeds the 4,000 twice and you're there. Jesus raises people back to life who are dead and you're there. And you're getting to see the whole thing. And it's so interesting because if you read in some of the writings from even non-Christian historians of the day, Historians who were against Jesus, even they did not deny that Jesus did some things that could not be explained. The Talmud quotes, Jesus the Nazarene practiced magic and deceived and led Israel astray. I mean, obviously not a favorable report, but notice this, that they did not deny what they saw with their own eyes. And friends, in our New Testament, the authors Matthew Mark, John, they did not document what they believed. They documented what they saw. And people all over the Middle East saw with their own eyes a man named Jesus who was doing incredible things, healing people who were born blind regularly, healing people who couldn't walk, and suddenly they're dancing all over the place. So as a result, when this healer, when this miracle worker, Jesus, would speak, people would listen. And here's the rest of that promise from earlier, John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Friends, this is the good news. History tells us, Christians and non-Christians, that there really was a man named Jesus. And eyewitnesses tell us that he really lived with character and integrity. People who were there, many who believed and many who didn't believe, they saw him crucified and they saw him die. Then they saw him again, alive, three days later. 
And the testimonies to the resurrection abound. The non-Christian religious leaders of the day, the Roman government, over 500 people are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. And friends, it's with this confidence that you and I can trust that Jesus really is who he claimed to be, God in the flesh. And that when he speaks, his words really are worth listening to. Because Christianity did not begin faith-based. Christianity began fact-based. Think about that. So why can we, followers of Jesus, stand strong and take heart in words that were written centuries ago by a man who lived in this small little town that many of us will never even go to? When we're 2,000 years removed from his language and his culture and his context because the foundation of our faith is fact. The foundation of our entire belief system is centered around a real-life calendared event, the resurrection of Jesus. And it's with this in mind that I would like for us to insert ourselves into the story of a man who, like many of us, at one point, he wasn't buying it. He felt like he was just a little too smart for all the fairy tales, and he wouldn't swallow a faith-based religion that he couldn't reconcile with proof and evidence. Acts chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters asking for their cooperation in the arrest of as many followers of Jesus as he could find. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. And as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you? And the voice replied, I'm Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. And here's this man who is a skeptic, but he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Prior to this encounter, he was anti-Christian. He was anti-Jesus. He wanted to squash the entire movement. But Jesus did something incredible, friends. Jesus found him. And then Jesus began to work in two directions, from the outside and then from the inside. From the outside, Jesus spoke directly to the man's circumstances. Very candidly, Jesus said, you are persecuting me. And in typical Jesus-like fashion, Jesus went straight to the truth. He didn't beat around the bush. And from the inside, Jesus began to work directly with the man's heart and the man's mind eventually resulting in this skeptic completely changing his flawed mindset, resulting in his hard heart breaking and softening to the truth of who Jesus really is. And it's through this earth-shattering encounter that Saul came to this fork-in-the-road moment, this point of decision where he was humbled outwardly but needed to humble himself inwardly. And a few days later, Saul came to the point where he finally, finally was able to admit that he'd been using his sharp intellect and his strategic mind that God had given him to work against God by plotting and scheming ways to destroy Christianity and followers of God's one and only son. He he had to admit that he'd been using his hands and that he'd been using his feet not to please God, but to crush all that God was trying to do in his country and in the hearts of his people. God had to do a work in Saul. God had to change the very way that Saul thought and processed God's plan and God's will. And fast forward a few years. Saul now goes by the name Paul, and he's a missionary for Jesus. The same Jesus that he used to persecute. I mean, go figure. And here's what he says to a group of believers in Rome. Romans chapter 12 And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. 
Don't copy the behaviors. Don't copy the customs of this world. But instead, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. Can you hear Paul's story in his plea to the believers? Can you hear how Paul is sharing his heart? Like, this is where I've been, y'all. And it's as if Paul's saying, listen, I get it. I was there. I used to think I had it all figured out. I used to think I had this all together. I used to think that I was the smartest person in every room. And then something happened. My world was shaken. Everything I thought I knew was thrown into disarray and upheaval. And I had this earth-shaking circumstance come my way. And it was in the middle of that disaster that God found me. And he began a work. And friends, I believe that Paul is saying the same thing to us today. Friends, there will come a point in your world where your life is intersected with pain. You thought you you could trust that guy, but he betrayed you. You thought your friends were real, but they abandoned you. You thought your career was stable, but you were let go. You thought you were invincible, but the biopsy results just came in. But let me tell you, it's in these moments, friends, that you have a choice. You can choose to give your body to God, to worship him with your life, or you can choose to blame him. Or you can choose to run out on him. And Paul is reminding us, he's saying, don't forget what God has done for you. Don't forget what he's done for you. For just a second, let's remember. Let's remember together Jesus on the last week before he died. One of his 12 disciples, one that Jesus had handpicked, who Jesus trusted so much, he put him in charge of the finances, conspired with the religious people of the day who hated Jesus and were publicly against Jesus to hatch a plot to get Jesus arrested and killed. And that same close friend who betrayed Jesus, he shared a meal with him the same night. And probably around midnight, he came with the temple guards who had swords and who had clubs to arrest Jesus. But check out how the rest of the story goes. He gives Jesus a kiss as a sign to the temple guards so they would know who to arrest. Judas chose one of the most intimate greetings he could as a slap in the face to Jesus. And do the disciples defend Jesus? Well, Peter tries, he cuts some guy's ear off, but in the meantime, all the disciples, all of them run away. Mark runs, John runs, Peter runs. They go into hiding, they don't help Jesus, they don't fight for him, they run and they leave him all alone with his accusers. And then Jesus is kept awake all night and he's put on trial before the religious leaders. The holy men who their whole job was to study the scriptures and tell people how they should obey God much like Saul, and they began accusing him of stuff he didn't do, intentionally lying to him, lying about him to the chief priest. Some would say he claimed that that this temple that was built with human hands, he could destroy it and he could start over and build a new one, not built with human hands. And it says that the guards would slap Jesus, they would blindfold him, they would punch him in the face, they would mock him and they would beat him and they would say these cruel things like, hey prophet, who hit you that time? And they would yell things like, he deserves to die. Meanwhile, one of Jesus' closest friends in the world, Peter, he's watching in a courtyard and he's denying that he, that he even knew Jesus so much so to the point of cussing, just to prove that he wasn't a follower of Jesus. Then, because Jews aren't allowed to kill people through torture, especially during the Holy Passover celebration, the the Jews took Jesus to the Roman government because they wanted him crucified to death. One of the cruelest forms of torture, when somebody was crucified, they would be tied to a wooden beam or they would be nailed to a wooden beam by their wrists. 
But that was after they were beaten 39 times with a whip made of nails and bone and metal and shards of glass. And as they were on this cross, they would be forced to hold themselves up and they would often dehydrate because they couldn't breathe and they would suffocate to death. Most people, most people died from the beating, the 39 stripes. Others would die on the way to the hill as they were carrying their cross. And this is what the holy men wanted to do with Jesus, and they succeeded. And as he hung on a cross, Jesus was being punished for our sins, for our mistakes, for our lies, for our deceit, so we wouldn't have to. Friends, just let that sink in for a second. This is the depth of the love that our God has for you. And then three days later, he did the unthinkable. He came back to life. When he came back to life, he proved that he had, that he has, and that he will always have the power and the victory, listen, over death, over hell, and the grave. And Jesus proved that regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the problem, the obstacle, no matter how this world is shaken, God cannot be conquered. And God will always win. Amen? God will always win. And this is what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12. He's saying, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Not out of guilt, but out of gratitude, let's serve him. Not by words only, but with our actions with our bodies, with our hands, with our feet, with everything, just like he did for us. Let your life be a daily sacrifice to him. Let your life be how you worship him. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. In other words, let pleasing God be why you do the good things that you do. In other words, don't be good just for goodness sake. Don't take the credit and do good just because you're a good person. Don't do good so you can have good things and stay away from bad so bad stuff doesn't happen to you. Don't do what's right so you won't get in trouble and so you'll be looked upon favorably by others. Instead, do good because he has always done good for you. Friends, that's motive. That's intention. And that's the only way to truly worship God. Friends, can I say this? Some of us need to repent of doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Maybe we're in church so we can please a girlfriend or a spouse. Maybe we're avoiding sin so we don't feel so guilty. Or maybe we're avoiding sin just so we don't get caught because we can't bear getting caught and found out. But hear this family, listen, we've got to repent. When you do the right things for the wrong reasons, that's called religion. And religion says things like this, I obey, therefore I'm accepted by God. I better do good or God will get me. I I better do good things and I better stay away from wrong things or everything's going to go bad. I've got to obey God and, and, and if I don't obey God, I won't get good stuff from God. But listen, a relationship with Jesus is so different. A relationship with Jesus says, I'm accepted already because of what Jesus has already done, therefore I obey. It's doing the right things for the right reasons. I obey God because he loves me. I obey God because I want more of God, not more of the stuff that he can give me. I obey God even when my circumstances go wrong. I know that God isn't punishing me because he's already paid the price. And my identity is not built on my track record or on my performance. Friends, the difference between relationship And religion matters to God so much. 1 Chronicles 28.9, learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. 
Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart and knows every plan and he knows every thought. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it actively divides the thoughts and the motives of the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by the appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Psalm 51, 16, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would have given you one. You don't want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. And friends, if you were ready to worship God this way, with all you have, with all your heart, here's what Paul is saying, that it's going to require you living out your convictions. It's going to require you to put Monday through Friday action behind your Saturday through Sunday worship. That means willingly denying yourself some things. It means you may want to move in with her, but you choose to honor God with your body instead because you were bought with a price. You may want to spend all of your money on yourself, but you choose to honor God with your tithe faithfully because all you have is a gift from him. And besides, he's your treasure, not your stuff. You may want to spend all your time vegging out and decompressing decompressing, but you choose to get involved at church and serve kids and serve teenagers by leading a life group because that's what saved people do. They serve God by serving others and you're a follower of Jesus so you can't help but live generously. And Paul goes a step further. He tells us how to get there. Romans 12, 2, so don't copy the behaviors, don't copy the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, which is pleasing, and it's perfect. God's not saying, hey, good luck changing your heart, good luck changing your mind, good luck, buddy. Here's what he's saying, he's saying, let me in. He's saying, stop trying harder not to think the way you do. Stop trying harder not to cuss. Stop trying harder not to get so angry. Instead, let me try. Let me continue to transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. In other words, if you'll rely on God, if you'll seek after him, and if you will let God change the way you think by reading his word slowly, thoroughly, one book at a time, one story at a time, I heard a pastor say it like this. He said I, he would take the book of John and he would start, let's say, in March. And every day in March, he would read chapters 1 through 7. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every day, read chapters 1 through 7. By the end of March, he could tell you every story. He, he could open up his Bible right here. This is where that happened. And he could quote it. And then in the month of April, he would take the next seven, seven chapters and he'd read them every day. It's just seven chapters, seven chapters. And in May, he'd read the last seven chapters. And by the time May was finished, he was finished with the book of John. What was he doing? He was learning to meditate on God's word. He was thinking about it over and over and over again, applying it to his story, letting it infiltrate every part of his life. Friends, if you'll begin memorizing God's word the way we do song lyrics, the way we do movie lines, if you'll begin intaking God's word regularly like we do our favorite shows, then the little habits, the little decisions that you make without thinking, the micro choices, those will begin to change also. And as your character is being shaped to make you more and more like Jesus, you'll find yourself making more and more choices that are good, that are pleasing, and are perfect in his sight. You'll begin to find your decisions in alignment with God's will. Because now you know his word. Friends, it's really hard to figure out God's will when you're not talking to him when you're not listening to him.
you bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, help us to live out our convictions. In a world that has the ability to shake us at our core and cause us to doubt everything that we've held sacred for so long, Father, remind us all that you have done for us. Your death in our place your resurrection to give us power, that you saw who we were and how dirty and broken and fallen we were, and you didn't leave us there. You cared enough about us to send your son to die in our place, to suffer the shame and humiliation so we wouldn't have to. That's why we can give you our bodies. That's why we can give you our minds to worship you the way you truly desire with our lives, with our actions, because we are filled not with guilt or shame, but with gratitude for your kindness to us. Help us to live constantly being transformed inwardly and outwardly not seeking to mimic the latest trends and fads, not seeking to be just like everyone else, but instead seeking to be more like you in every way, that you would change the way we think, even our motivations, why we do what's right, why we don't do what's wrong, that you would have your hand on every part of us, that we would love you, we would love what you love, that we'd be driven away and repelled from the things that are no good for us that we would be in this world, but not of this world, all thanks to your son, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Friends, we love you, we thank the world of you, it is such a privilege to get to do what we do every week. And if you're a high school senior or a young adult, you're invited to join us in the Student Center for our Connect Night, and you are officially dismissed. God bless.